end of quote. In politics, Aristotle is especially critical of the Spartan constitution. His critique involves the charge that such militarism encourages a warped sense of civic virtue focused only on valor. Nonetheless, Aristotle recognizes that some, in his time, find a democratic element in the Spartan constitution, particularly in the educational, commensal, and other daily practices, namely that public and common education was given to the sons of both rich and poor families, common meals were held at public messes, and people wore similar clothing. Despite his praise for the Lycurgian Sparta, however, Aristotle takes distance from his contemporary Sparta, particularly because of Sparta's loss of imperial power, the general unhappiness of the population, and their exaltation of material wealth obtained by military conquest more highly than civic virtue itself. Other historical accounts of the Greco-Roman world also make important references to commensal practices. Philo of Alexandria, whose attempt to reconcile Greek philosophy with Judaism, provides an affirmative description of the Essenes, a small good Jewish group of 4,000 people living as a rustic, ascetic, and law-abiding community. In his piece called Every Good Man is Free, Philo depicts the Essenes as a group that avoids war, trade, and cities as corrupting influences on their existence. <coughs> they are all similarly bereft of slavery, private property, and the family. Each member contributes to the common stock with which the sick and the elderly are taken care of. The system of government is based on the leadership of the elders. Individuals dress similarly and eat together. Philo describes them exalting their communal fellowship as follows. In the first place then, there is no one who has a house so absolutely his own private property that it does not in some sense also belong to everyone. For besides that they all dwell together in companies, the house is open to all those of the same notions who come to them from other quarters. Then there is one magazine among them all their expenses are all in common, their garments belong to them all in common, their food is in common, since they all eat in messes, for there is no other people among which you can find a common use of the same house, a common adoption of one mode of living, and a common use of the same table more thoroughly established, in fact, than among this tribe. And is this not very natural? Similarly, Philo's account of the Therapeutae echoes the Essenes. The Therapeutae, whose name derives, quote, either because they process an art of medicine more excellent than in general use in the cities, for the one in the cities only heals bodies, but this one also heals souls, or else because they've been instructed by nature and the sacred laws to serve the living God, end of quote, according to Philo, is an isolated community gathered together near Alexandria's Mariotic Lake. The members of this community, devoted exclusively to the study of divine laws, have left behind their earthly possessions to their children or friends when they decided to join the Therapeutae in order to live a life of piety and the contemplation of nature marked by their anxious desire for an immortal and blessed existence. Most days are spent in solitude, devoted to meditation on pract and practice of virtue. However, after six days of solitary meditation, the community gathers together to listen to the sermon of an elder, though they are segregated on the basis of gender. Every seven weeks, there is a communal feast in contrast to the immoderate and spectacular feasting practices of Philo's time, characterized by frequent quarrels, pedestry, and entertainment provided by professional amusers, all of which Philo unhesitatingly disapproves, the feasts of the Therapeutae are marked by humility, modesty, and moderation. In contrast to the degenerate banquets with rich delicacies and luxurious foods, 
where the guests recline on couches and sofas around tables, ornamented with precious metals and exquisite wares, those of the therapeutae begin with prayers and commence with the collective consumption of bread, salt, and hyssop. To the prevailing banquet customs where the service of the guests are conducted by well-shaped slaves of the most exquisite, exquisite beauty, ministering as if they had come not more for the purpose of serving the guests than of delighting the eyes of the spectators by their mere appearance, Philo writes, the banquets of the Therapeutae also stand in stark contrast. Not only is there no wine, but men and women, clothed modestly in white, though seated separately, dine together, sitting on coarse mats and not reclining. And there are no slaves to serve the feasters, but rather free men who take on the task of service voluntarily as a way to perfect their virtue. The commensal experience is simultaneously pedagogical in that it is accompanied by a discussion of difficult passages in the sacred scriptures with the purpose of bringing to light the secret meanings of the allegories therein. The feasting ends with the singing of hymns as a sign of thanksgiving. Moving forward in time, we observe this asceticism in Seneca's Epistulae Morales, which presents a stoic condemnation of the Roman Cena, where in contrast to the more philosophical symposium, eating and drinking in large amounts constitutes the most prominent activity. Seneca condemns the greedy and indulgent behavior of the participants of these Roman banquets as indications of a depraved and insatiable soul, the inability of constraint and individual integrity, and the absence of individual integrity, self-knowledge and happiness. According to Seneca, what and how an individual eats is revealing of who he is, his morality, judgment, and inner freedom. Richardson Hay argues, drawing a comparison between gladiatorial games and public feasts, the dinners Seneca describes were usually public affairs, and just as everyone joins in and cheers on the cruel events at the gladiatorial games, a meal also becomes a spectacle and a performance in which everyone participates. In these occasions, individuals get embroiled in the psychology of the crowd and the moment of the spectacle and lose moral control by displaying their insatiable appetite, gorging on the food. From a stoic perspective, a controlled appetite and moderation in eating exemplifies the knowledge of living well. It is compared with how an individual will face death. One not knowing how to live well will also fear death. Like one, quote, immoderately given to wine who drains the jar dry and sucks up even the dregs, end of quote. In this spirit, Richardson Hay contends the ideas of banqueting and torture come together more than once in Seneca's mind. The spectacular feast for Seneca can be understood as a metaphor for death itself. <coughs> also important in this context is Seneca's awareness of the inequalities that surround the communal dining table, served by slaves who prepare the food, serve them, clean, clean up after them, though they could not sit with their masters. According to Seneca, it is in fact the diners who are the real slaves to their passions, and who fail at being masters of themselves. While Seneca's rhetorical displacement of slavery on glutinous masters is interesting, in the realm of the dominated, there is an inclusive egalitarianism that develops at this time around the table, which ensures mechanisms of leveling across diverse participants otherwise marked by differences in gender, class, ethnicity, and social status. In this light, commensal practices are referenced in the Gospels several times. I'm quoting, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. When asked with complaint why he was eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus answers them as follows, 
It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. The parable of the grand banquet also speaks to commensality. It tells the story of a man who sends his servant to invite guests for dinner, all of whom decline his invitation, making excuses related to their own business. Upon hearing this, the man invites all the poor and underprivileged people from the streets to fill his house and enjoy his banquet. He makes the point to exclude the originally invited guests. The fruits of life, including spiritual ones, are open to those who are willing to share and to receive them. More strikingly, commensality is a constant component of the classical genre of utopian writings. I've already mentioned Plato's Republic. Diodorus of Sicily writes of a fictional journey of Iambolus to the islands of the sun, where a people called Helopolitans, the inhabitants of these perfect islands, share a communal life. Not only do they rule by taking turns, but they also live in a social system where family does not exist and children are raised communally. In this egalitarian society, markedly different from existing social formations of the time, inhabitants wear similar clothes and eat the same foods in common meals. The same theme is echoed in the early 16th century, once more, in Thomas More's Utopia. In the island of Utopia, everything is under, under public ownership, and no one fears starvation. Everyone knows how to cultivate the land and takes up a trade. Idleness is not encouraged, but the working day is shortened, with more time devoted to leisure and learning. Everyone wears the same dress, lives in similar dwellings, and dines together. The communal dining halls and the cooking and eating equipment, just like the chains of the slaves who do the dirty work there, are made of precious metals, of gold and silver, in order, Moore argues, to bring these metals into contempt. Moore provides precise and elaborate details regarding how the women should do the cooking taking turns, the seating arrangements at the mess tables, with political representatives of each household and priests occupying an honorific table, men and women sitting across one another, how the elders should be served first and most, and the rest of the food should be divided equally, how the topic of conversation should begin with literature and then move slowly into politics and the discussion of serious problems. <coughs> However, after the 16th century, the theme of commensality largely drops out from political theory. It plays little role in the treatises of utopian socialists. It is not a significant component of Marxist or anarchist thinking. So why did the philosophers give up on commensality? We can only speculate. But Karl Kautsky's interpretation of Thomas More's utopia is revealing in this respect. Kautsky views More as having made, quote, a bold intellectual leap at a time when the capitalist mode of production was in its infancy, end of quote, and thus having laid the blueprint for modern socialism. Inspired by Plato and the contemporary conditions of his time, which led to the misery of the working classes, Kotsky argues, Moore is able to propose an alternative world where the ownership of the land and the products of the land would be held in common. However, because the industry of Moore's utopia is based on handicrafts and peasant agriculture, Kotsky contends, quote, Moore was obliged to lay all the greater stress upon the social character of meals and pleasures. Moore also viewed the common meals as a partial means of emancipating women from household